So the creation of uh, NASA pretty much wasn't for humanitarian purposes, but uh, it was motivated primarily by uh, the strategy of military dominance of space, which basically we've already discussed is uh, what's happening right now. Um, and so it was the Soviets versus the U.S. Uh, at that time, and uh, communism versus capitalism, pretty much this uh, you know international false left right paradigm, because pretty much you know banks and um, other interests are all behind this, and uh, really they have no loyalty. And they were dominating both sides during the entire time, mm -hmm. um, you know, funding the communists and capitalists uh, mm -hmm. in both side parts of the world. But uh, in general, um, Operation Paperclip is pretty much considered like a, you know, foundational thing to understand uh, what it entailed and, and what everything was dealt with. Now, the reason it's called Operation Paperclip is because it dealt with um, the bringing in of mostly German uh, immigrants, Austrian immigrants, people who worked under the Nazis and uh, were brought into the United States to work under NASA and uh, with the intelligence agencies as well in order to give them information that they had discovered and researched about during uh, the time under Adolf Hitler because they were doing a lot of experimentation with uh, rocketry, with uh, you know health uh, things in the military, uh, all kinds of different stuff that they wanted to find out about. Um, you know, mind control operations, other things, brainwashing, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So there were a lot of things that were brought over, and the reason it's called Operation Paperclip is because on their immigration tags would be paperclipped uh, the government agency that were, who had requested them and wanted their information with all of their papers and everything. Mm -hmm. So it came to be known as Operation Paperclip. Yeah, and it, uh, they would modify these people's files to instead of saying an ardent Nazi to saying not an ardent Nazi, uh, which is also revealed in another documentary, it's pretty good, called Secret Space. It's got some uh, wild stuff, you can check that out as well. But they, uh, we had uh, Werner Von Braun pretty much, uh, who made the V-2 rockets, was part of um, <clears throat> NASA. Von Braun was in charge of a mountain uh, rocket base uh, in Nazi Germany where uh, 40,000 people basically perished. Um, so, I mean, there's some pretty... Uh, Under like slave-like conditions. Yeah. Working uh, for these experiments and other stuff. So, the um, actual history of where these things come from are pretty disturbing when you find out about it. And um, this isn't to say that, you know, we're against space exploration or anything like that. I think that if it was all being done uh, for the correct purposes, you know, it actually could be a really good thing for humanity mm -hmm. and could move us along, uh, you know, mentally and evolutionary as a species. Mm -hmm. But we have to mm -hmm. basically get our stuff together here and uh, stop fighting amongst ourselves and um, to get things straight and to uh, live sustainable and harmonious existence. Uh, otherwise, uh, what we're doing in space is going to be all bad. Um, so understanding this history is key. We need to uh, build, like, basically transform our uh, space program kind of culture and uh, take it back from these uh, uh, sick, tyrannical people. Yeah, the way that this um, really first got exposed was, um, you know, it had been exposed over the years to various, um, you know, declassified documents and things. But in 1995, there was a hearing uh, in the Congress, and they had a hearing on human radiation experiments that had happened during the 50s and 60s. And there they discuss uh, the MKUltra program and various other programs and also Operation Paperclip, which was where a lot of these scientists who did these experiments, uh, you know, how they were brought over, basically. And so this was mentioned and told to the whole Congress. So the federal government knows well about this. Your congressmen know about this. Your senators know about it. Yeah. Uh, it's just the general public that doesn't seem to know about these issues. So that's why we're trying to inform all of you. Yeah, and uh, basically all these uh, Nazis were um, able to evacuate themselves uh, from the country through something called the Rat Lines, which uh, Jim Mars in his book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, uh, which is an excellent book I urge anybody to check out. It'll shatter your uh, paradigm of reality that you have right now. Um, it talks about how the Catholic Church was one of the main uh, arbiters of uh, these people's uh, evacuation from the country, saying that they were church officials and stuff. And, uh, it's pretty disturbing. A bunch from like the movie Evita actually uh, gets into that as well. And that's why so many ended up in uh, Catholic countries as well, in Argentina, Argentina. and uh, in, in Colombia, and Brazil, and uh, Chile. Yeah, and some of them mm -hmm. uh, ended up here, not just, you know, space program stuff, but uh, to continue their sadistic experiments. Um, it was uh, revealed uh, by uh, Kevin Annette, who is a former uh, reverend or uh, minister up in uh, Canada at uh, Port Alberni. 
um, that there were actual uh, indigenous people that were taken off of their reservations and children put into these uh, residential schools were being experimented on uh, as well as other horrible things um, by Nazi, uh, former Nazi German scientists. Um, so yeah, if you go read the reports um, from the National Security Archive and uh, about these uh, human radiation experiments and the people that were involved in the stuff they are doing, uh, uh, you will be horrified, I can guarantee you. Uh, if you aren't already by all the stuff we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyways, that's uh, that for our history segment. Uh, Mr. Gaddon, uh, just to introduce uh, him for our viewers, uh, is a, a former veteran from Vietnam, correct? Vietnam era. Era. And uh, he's an activist organizer that's worked on uh, space, space issues for more than 20 years and helped co-found Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And uh, he's here today to discuss the weaponization of space, not widely discussed projects and other issues concerning all of humanity's safety uh, related to nuclear propulsion and weapons. Um, for people out there who don't know, uh, what is the weaponization of space? How long has it been going on? Uh, what does it consist of? Well, really, it began just after World War II, when the U.S. military smuggled former Hitler Nazi rocket scientists into the United States in a program called Operation Paperclip. Uh, they were brought in to really create the U.S. space program. Werner von Braun was the guy that was creating the V-1 and V-2 rockets for Hitler's uh, uh, military that were used to terrorize the people of London and Paris and Brussels toward the, ends of, toward the end of World War II. And so uh, Von Braun and his team, about 100 of them, brought uh, about 100 copies of the V-2 rocket to the U.S., first to uh, New Mexico and then to Huntsville, Alabama, where they again created the U.S. space program. So ever since that time, uh, the, the military has been working on it, knowing that whoever controlled space would really have a leg up in controlling the Earth. And so today the Space Command military command. Its job is to give the U.S. control and domination of space and ultimately to give the uh, uh, U.S. the control of the planet Earth. Um, could you explain a little bit more about um, having control over who can or cannot uh, that strategic position? Because I've uh, watched a documentary with uh, you explaining that. Could you explain that for our viewers? Yeah, it's called the Earth-Moon Gravity Well. Now, they say, think of it like a wishing well. Imagine someone is down inside the bottom of a well, and you're at the top. You put a lid on it. You can keep them from getting out of the well because of gravity. You, know, you have gravity on your side because you're at the top, they're at the bottom. Well, it's the same way between the Earth and the Moon. And the Pentagon is saying that whoever controls the Earth-Moon gravity well by having bases on the moon and by having armed space stations in space, orbiting battle stations basically, uh, in space, uh, will control who gets on and off planet Earth. And in the years ahead, when the corporations hope to be able to go out and mine the sky for precious minerals and resources, you know, they say there's gold on the asteroids, there's magnesium and cobalt, uranium on Mars, there's helium-3 on the moon. And the, the NASA's job now is to create the technology so that they can go out and mine the sky in the years ahead. So they want to be able to control who gets on and off the Earth so that uh, these corporations will essentially control the extraction of resources in space. So isn't uh, all of those activities against the 1967 UN Treaty uh, governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space? Well, <clears throat> it, it was not a very uh, definitive treaty. That treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, banned weapons of mass destruction in space. And so the Pentagon today, I mean, the Space Command, they maintain that the kind of weapons that they're talking about do not violate the treaty. That in fact they say these are weapons of selective destruction and therefore they fall outside of the bounds of the treaty. Gee. And that's why Russia and China for years have been going to the United Nations 
trying to negotiate, trying to get the United States to join them in negotiating a new inter international treaty to ban all weapons in space, what they call peros, preventing an arms race in outer space. And so uh, for all these years, during the Clinton years, during the Bush years, now during the Obama years, the U.S. is blocking, essentially blocking, the development of that treaty because, again, the weapons corporations view space as a new market. The Pentagon views space as the high ground that they want to control so they can control the Earth. For many years, uh, the U.S. just outright blocked the possibility of the treaty, along with Israel. Israel's always been our partner in blocking the treaty. But now they, the U.S. has taken a more sophisticated stance, and they just uh, they just uh, don't vote on it, which means it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, they abstain. They're one of the five on the Security Council. Could you tell us a bit about your organization, uh, where they come from, what your mission is? Yeah, we created the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space in 1992, and today it's made up of about 150 organizations all over the world. As the satellites orbit the Earth, uh, U.S. military satellites. They have to talk to uh, ground stations, what they call downlink facilities. And so in order to have planetary coverage and planetary communication from these U.S. military satellites, the U.S. has set up these downlink bases all over the planet. And we have peace activists in those countries saying, we don't want our country to be used by the United States to create this Star Wars program. And so Peace groups in those countries uh, early on became members of the global network, and they're really the key, uh, the core of, of our uh, membership around the world today. And every year we have a meeting in a different part of the world where uh, we go and talk to activists who have these kind of U.S. bases uh, in their country. Last year we met in Seoul, South Korea, where the United States is now deploying missile defense systems, supposedly to protect uh, us from attack by, uh, they say, North Korea. But in fact, these missile defense systems are part of the U.S. first strike strategy that is today being aimed at China and Russia as we try to surround both countries today. And we deploy these missile defense systems whose jobs uh, would be to take out any remaining missiles after the United States hit them in a first strike attack. So in the case of China, today they have 20 nuclear missiles that are capable of hitting the west coast of the United States, your part of the world. Yeah. And so if after we hit them in a first strike, let's say we knock out 15 of their, of their missiles capable of hitting the U.S., then they launch a retaliatory strike and they have five left. Missile defense system's job then is to take out that remaining five missiles. And so uh, th there we met last year in South Korea. This coming year in October, we'll meet in India, which the United States is now trying to drag into the whole Star Wars program because India has long been a rival with China. And this is all part of the U.S. strategy to surround Russia and China today. Yeah, I've seen that in a lot of um, the activities going on, especially in the wars around the world. It seems as if the Middle East and uh, Central Asia are stepping stones uh, for the greater goal, which is Russia. I think that that's really the ultimate goal here. Well, Russia, as we now know, has the world's largest supply of natural gas. And resources. And yeah, so that's what everything we do in the military, uh, what the U.S. military does today is all about resource control. The reason why we're in Afghanistan, I'm sure you know, is, is about pipeline routes, taking the Caspian Sea resources, the oil and natural gas, from north of Afghanistan in the Caspian Sea, and then routing that through Afghanistan and Pakistan, rather than China and Russia, who live in that neighborhood, allowing them to have uh, decision-making about where those pipelines are going to go. So that's why we're there in Afghanistan, setting permanent bases up there in that region, right alongside uh, the borders of really both Russia and China. I mean, many people would be hard pressed to believe that NASA is uh, doing anything uh, but good operations and research and 